The Girl on the Porch is really a novella more than a novel. Normally, that shouldn't matter. A novel can obviously be any length, from hovering around 100 pages to epic full saga shogun length. If the story arcs in a gratifying way with good pacing and a well-placed beginning, middle, and end, the length of the book shouldn't have really any effect on the quality of the read. In fact, you may not even notice it. Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is a great example of a novella that is so well paced, you have no sense of its length. For The Girl on the Porch, I feel the length of the book mattered because I think the shorter length shortchanged Chismar's fascinating story a little bit. Chismar makes excellent use of the bit of time he does have to expose us to the people in the house that have the porch that has the girl on it, namely the Tuckers, Kenny and Sarah, including a robust and juicy backstory that's relevant to the mystery of the girl ending up on their porch. She proves to be a disruption that they may not be able to handle based on what they've been through in their lives together, but the thing is the girl came from somewhere. You may know from the book's description that the book is about a mysterious girl who appears in the security camera footage of Kenny and Sarah's porch with a shackle on her wrist. Kenny and Sarah don't discover she was there until a day later, which begs the question, where did she go? And where did she come from? Who shackled her? How did she get out? Is anybody on her trail? Does that anybody know she was caught on Kenny and Sarah's camera? In other words, she wasn't born on Kenny and Sarah's porch. She arrives with a story, one that you assume involves other characters in the book. And this is where the shorter novel does the story a bit of a disservice. We know the other characters, but we know very little about them. What we do learn is superficial and seemingly there mostly to feed Kenny and Sarah's story. If the writing axiom for story exposure is show, don't tell, we end up with a bit more tell in some instances because it's simply more expedient. But the telling doesn't necessarily flesh out the other characters, or even always Kenny and Sarah. We're not shown enough of who they are to see their depth. That said, Chismar does an excellent job of making us care immediately about the mystery at the center of the story. He has that in common with Stephen King, who not only hooks you within the first sentence of his books, but he actually gets you to fully buy in also within the first sentence. That sounds like hyperbole until you recall how many first sentences in a book you've read that didn't necessarily make you want to read the next sentence. You just did because you're not going to give up that quickly. You know there's an excellent chance you'll be hooked within a few paragraphs or pages, so who cares? But King will get buy-in from you right out of the gate. It's like he's not leaving it to chance that he'll get you a little farther down the page. Chismar has a similar down-to-earth approach to starting the story from the point where it matters, where we're going to care. I don't know if it's apocryphal, but Elmore Leonard supposedly said about his own writing, I just eliminate the boring parts. King does that for sure. Chismar too. From the first page, he's authentic and drops us right into the action, and we know we've been leapfrogged over all the boring stuff. From there though, there really are no lulls, with one minor exception, when Chismar bafflingly takes us through a poker game, play for play. I'm still wondering why he didn't replace the poker plays with expository conversation among the guys at the poker table, Kenny's friends, who become extremely important to the rest of the story, and just splice in the occasional poker play. I kept thinking about Ken Follett's A Dangerous Fortune that includes a fabulous moment where two people are having a pivotal conversation over dinner and Follett drops nuggets about their dining as an interspersed backdrop to all the important conversation. It plays so well because we actually learn a bit about the two characters based on the dining mentions and it's information we wouldn't otherwise be able to get but for that dinner backdrop. I thought Chismar lost an opportunity to give us some character building nuggets during the poker game. But again, that was just one scene. I don't mean to put too much emphasis on it. In fact, it only stands out because otherwise every scene, every bit of dialogue really drives the plot at a very quick pace, I think. But yes, plot. Since we don't get to know too much about the people we meet along the way, the scenes and dialogue drive plot more than story. But Chismar's more in-depth look at Kenny and Sarah and some of their neighbors keeps the overall story from starring a bunch of stick figures. The story is also wonderfully creepy in all the right places. Like the play within the play, the actual girl on the porch ends up in Book World having a story within the story. Within Book World, her story goes viral, which keeps it from ever fading from our world as we read the book. It's a great tool, 
her story going viral because it becomes bigger than Kenny and Sarah. And you never forget that something very mysterious, creepy, and even possibly deadly is afoot. It lets Chismar weird you out just by having someone stand behind a tree or walk down a dark street. But even Chismar's daytime is beautifully edgy. This is a suburban story about suburban people going about their lives, so it doesn't just take place in the shadows of the night. The ever-present story within a story means we're reminded all the time that creepiness and eeriness lurk. Circling back to the length of the novella, as the story wraps up, we get there a little fast and a little superficially. The best way I can illustrate this is to talk about Alfred Hitchcock for a second. Hitchcock aficionados know the term MacGuffin, which is what Hitchcock called the meaningless plot point that seems to drive a story but that doesn't matter at all to the story which turns on something else in the foreground that is the thing we actually care about. So for example, in his film Notorious, Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman are spying for the good guys. And it doesn't really matter what the bad guys are doing. They just need to be doing bad guy stuff so that our good guy spies have a purpose and we can enjoy them as they go about that purpose. Hitchcock would call that bad guy stuff the MacGuffin. The key to a MacGuffin driven story is that the story will hold up no matter what the MacGuffin is. That's why it's a MacGuffin, a made up thing. So in our spy story, are the bad guys trading in secret codes, a secret formula, cultivating a natural resource to do bad guy stuff with it, like building something bad for the world, unleashing a nasty virus? It doesn't really matter. Those are all just a MacGuffin, a thing our bad guys are into that gives our good guys a reason to chase them. What we care about is the chase and the chaser or the chasers, not the reason they're doing the chasing. Not every story is MacGuffin driven or even has a MacGuffin. In fact, arguably many or most novels and films don't have a MacGuffin. Not even all Hitchcock films have a MacGuffin. Romantic comedies, for example, which are about the joys of people falling in love have no MacGuffin. Okay, so why am I talking about this? Because, well, the girl on the porch skirts up against having a MacGuffin in one aspect that I don't want to spoil. The shorter length of the book makes for an abrupt MacGuffin reveal. When we learn what we came there to learn and see why we're there, we sort of say, huh, really? Hmm. The why of it all almost seems accidentally MacGuffin-esque because it feels inadvertently interchangeable and inadvertently unrelated to the larger story, as though Chismar didn't mean for it to end up that way. The accidental MacGuffin, if you will, that I think was actually supposed to be a major story point, so not a meaningless MacGuffin, makes itself known too quickly and there isn't enough foundation for it. If this book had been even just 50 pages longer, Chismar could have tied elements together with more story glue to make this big reveal a linear part of the foreground of the story, which is what I think Chismar was going for. I wish Chismar had expanded this story just a tad, just fleshed it out here and there. There are two detectives that are instantly relatable characters, and I would have loved if they had been given more time on the canvas. For the time they are there, they're compelling. They drive the story really well, and literally, they are scene stealers. Like if this were a movie, you'd be waiting for them to show back up and likely the producer would start reworking the script while filming to give them more screen time. So an extra even just 20 to 30 pages to give them more time in the foreground would have been fun to read. We talk about what dreams may come here on Perchance to Read and Chismar definitely got me to daydream about all the places he could have taken his detectives in this story. As for the girl on the porch, the actual girl on Kenny and Sarah's porch, I've left her out on purpose. No spoilers. You'll have to read the book to find out who she is and why she ended up on Kenny and Sarah's porch. Have you read The Girl on the Porch? Let everyone know in the comment section and please share what you thought of the book or tell us what else you're reading. A link to where you can find this book and links to other reading suggestions are in the description. And please like, share, and subscribe. That's all from LA and perchance to read today. I hope you'll come back to the channel for what's next, to let us know what you're reading, and to see what dreams may come when you enjoy the read. Thanks for watching.